on Sky News Australia. This is the Rita Panahi Show Overtime. Welcome to the Rita Panahi Show Overtime. Coming up today, we'll be speaking with Emily Carver about the mess that is Irish politics as new laws are proposed to further curb free speech. We'll speak to a Melbourne man who was targeted by police for being pro-Israel during an anti-Israel protest. And the Kinsey Schofield will bring us the latest celebrity news from the royals to a supermodel pushing dangerous lies on Instagram. And as always, we will have plenty of lefties losing it from Doctor Who's pronoun obsession to Harvard activists again disgracing their school. But first, the latest local and international news with Sky News contributor Prue McSween. Prue, let's start with local news. The federal government has admitted that the agency in charge of fitting GPS ankle bracelets on convicted pedophiles and murderers didn't actually have the devices. Small point. It's now updated recent laws on Monday to grant enforcement powers to immigration authorities. This follows the High Court ruling deeming indefinite detention unlawful. So we've got 138 individuals so far released from immigration detention. The PM and the Home Affairs Minister Pro look inept here. They are inept, don't they, Rita? You, they wonder why they're doing so badly in the polls. It's because we've woken mm. up to them. They are asleep at the wheel. They are so inexperienced and they're contemptuous of the things that matter to us. Safety, security, the fact that we should be able to determine who can stay in this country. We do not want criminals to be able to appeal uh, and, and then have the benefit of our welfare system and put this the rest of the citizens on edge and wondering if they're going to be raped or pillaged or murdered. Who knows? You know, it's a responsibility of governments to keep communities safe and Albanese's government has done a giant fail on this matter. And uh, one of these characters has gone AWOL already, so hopefully they locate him shortly. Now, you mentioned the polls and the latest news poll shows support for the government and the PM falling further. Labor's primary vote is down another 4%, now to 31%. And in two party preferred terms, it's now 50-50 between Labor and the coalition. Uh, the honeymoon is well and truly over, Prue. Sure is, Rita. And, you know, we're all waking up to uh, Albanese. We, we saw his performance in the lead up to the election where some of us had a lot of doubts about his ability to be across detail and he seemed to be parroting someone else's words. I didn't feel he was sincere and had the passion to really do the job properly. And now the game's up. You know, we saw it during The, Vo the Voice where he had a total tin ear. His hubris overrode any judgment uh, and he's never been able to recover from that. And we've seen a, a bank of ministers who really have no experience and not in touch with what the average middle class worker wants. And we're seeing now in that crucial traditional Labor voting area um, of a, a de demographic where they've just abandoned him because they see that they're not working for the worker. They, you know, are introducing IR laws that are going to kill off jobs. Uh, productivity is down the toilet. The cost of living, the fact that all of us are looking mm. down the back of our lounges to find $2 coins to try and get by. Uh, whoever thought that we'd be in this situation? It's because this government has been too focused on virtue signalling and not what matters to us. Now, Parliamentary Committee reviewing the 2022 federal election has proposed increased representation for the ACT and Northern Territory, suggesting the number of senators for both areas should rise from two to four senators. Pru, I haven't heard a worst idea since, I don't know, defund the police. This would be utter madness. 
utter madness, Rita, and dangerous because <laughs> we know that they're going to try and stack it with lefties, greenies, so that they have the ultimate power. The, the Labor government has the ultimate mm. power in the Senate and will be able to push through really crook and bad policy. And we're seeing it already with this, you know, this Prime Minister who said he would never deal with the Greens. Well, he's just done it with, you know, the water and uh, water rights and he, you know, will continue, particularly after this next election where there's a very strong chance that he's going to be in minority and he's going to need the Greens to stay in power. So it's so dangerous. We have inept if politicians. If yeah, exactly. I mean, it is very scary. And I just think that, you know, politicians that are, we have representing us now are so inept that you've got to say, wow, we don't need any more of them on the, the payroll. I know Labor types are already talking about minority, minority government in the next term, but, you know, they'll be lucky to be in any sort of power the way they're going. Uh, they have not had a, a sweet run at all, except from the media, because for a good 12 months there, if not more, they have just had a golden run from the media. But people are feeling the pain. The cost of living is something you just cannot deny. Those, those mm. costs are increasing at a rapid rate. Um, now, moving on to the impact of lockdowns, the whole COVID catastrophe. And we're now seeing a growing number of school children who are becoming paralysed by social anxiety, who are skipping school, falling further behind academically. Even high achieving students are finding themselves unable to attend regular classes due to anxiety. Uh, this is uh, after we had school closures in Victoria. We had multiple school closures, multiple lockdowns, and the devastating impacts are still being felt with some kids pro who still cannot go back to school they've got all sorts of social anxieties and and some have fallen behind so far that they don't want to go to school anymore yes well you know my first inclination when i heard this was well you know get them back to school what are you doing parents you know don't cotton wool your kids but of course this is really a syndrome now and i i accept that when you think about the fact that kids from almost early childhood are being told that the world's going to end with, you know, the catastrophizing of climate. And now, of course, the impact of COVID and the, as you say, the isolation, the fact that they haven't had the social interaction and the anxiety is real. You know, we need, this generation has been really had, a, had a, such a rough time and you really have to feel for them. But, you know, instead of wasting money on other things, maybe the government needs to find some way of giving parents the kind of financial assistance and medical help to get these kids confident and back out into the, to mm. the, the world again. You know, it's really quite sad. And this entire crisis entirely predictable. We were warning about this as it was happening, that there was going to be so many grave exactly. unintended consequences if we kept closing schools, closing down society. But, you know, we're all called granny killers at the time. Now, let's move on to some US news. About a week or so ago, we had that footage of Trump getting huge cheers as he entered Madison Square Garden for a UFC event. And it's happened again, this time down at uh, in South Carolina at a football game. But guess how the media reported that response? Newsweek said former President <laughs> Donald Trump was met with loud boos as he arrived at williams Bryce Stadium in South Carolina on Saturday. Now, I looked for other footage to see and hear the reaction. And I've got to tell you, no matter what I looked at, all I could hear was cheering, not boos. <laughs>
crew. I doubt very much. In fact, I know for sure President Joe Biden wouldn't be getting that sort of reaction <laughs> and certainly not in South Carolina. No, that's for sure. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because most politicians tend to know that irrespective, they're going to get booed. So it just shows you the level of support for, for Trump. And it's hilarious that the media, you know, they're following that policy of, you know, if you get what you wish for, if you say it often enough, it'll come true. Well, sadly, <laughs> in this case, it hasn't worked. Well, they do get away with it, though. I mean, they're increasingly being fact-checked. Uh, I love this community notes feature on X or formerly Twitter where uh, people can fact-check news organisations, prime ministers, anybody really, and, and put some context to some of the claims that are being made. Uh, now, I've got some heartwarming footage for you here, Prue. This is uh, an Arab-Israeli major, Fawaz Hussain, is an IDF soldier who was wounded defending a kibbutz on October 7. Here he is walking out of hospital after 44 days of treatment. <laughs> Just some heartwarming footage at, at a harrowing time when we're seeing so much uh, heartbreak and devastation. It's good to get a story like that. Yeah, and rare, isn't it, that something as positive as that about the Israelis is, going, is getting some sort of publicity? Yes, absolutely. Now it's time for Lefties Losing It. Prue, let's start in school. And I regret to inform you that the kids are not all right. These are kids at Hillcrest High School in New York going on a rampage because one of their teachers went to a pro-Israel rally. This is a school in Queens. Uh, and the poor teacher here had to hide in a locked office for her own protection during this ride. I think we'll see a picture of her shortly. But this is just absolutely appalling antics from students who uh, they just feel like they can get away with anything here look, look at how they're behaving it's so scary isn't it it's alarming but it's not surprising Brita because kids are not taught any respect anymore and teachers are either handcuffed they can't or hampered they can't discipline kids anymore you'll have a parent on the phone uh, or you could be up for bullying or abuse and so we have the animals in the zoo running riot and and feeling that they can just do whatever it suits them to do uh, I don't know what, where, what the solution is because I fear that the train's left the station now and we have a bunch of uh, rampant imbeciles who just feel that they can do and say anything. And uh, who'd want to be a teacher anymore? Who'd want to be anyone in authority anymore? Because sadly, as I say, they're running it, not, not the authoritarian figure. Oh, I tell you, the sense of entitlement amongst those kids and, and that mm. same school had issues just a couple of weeks earlier where uh, security officers were attacked. So the, the, this is not an isolated incident. Mm. Now let's go to some kids who haven't yet been fully indoctrinated into leftist lunacy, though this next educator is a trying. See how she explains uh, getting owned by a three-year-old. So I'm at work. And those of you who don't know me, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm a preschool teacher. So instead of using Mr. or Miss, we use Mix. So the kids have been really awesome doing that. I work with three and four-year-olds. One of my kiddos came up to me and he goes, Are you mixed up? Is, are you mixed up? I was like, no, sweetie, I'm not mixed up. I just use... I just use mix instead of Mr. or Mrs. And he's like, okay, I was worried. 
Now, I think the three-year-old nailed it right there. Bit mixed up, Prue. I mean, do really, do we need to have three and four-year-olds having to contend with uh, neo-pronouns, with mix and, and, and whatever else uh, these uh, early educators are going to come up with? Well, this is the terrifying thing that our children are being brainwashed and exposed to this. I mean, out of the mouths of babes comes, comes nothing truer than what that little <laughs> child said. But how terrifying and how alarming that this woman is being allowed to parrot this absolute bull to these kids and groom them in, in this way. I mean, if I was a parent and saw that, I would be getting my kid out of there. And honestly, there's a lot to be said for homeschooling these days days. Oh, absolutely. We've got the patience for it. Now, let's go to where academia is well and truly broken. College campuses across the US where lefties losing it is an everyday event. University of Southern California professor there, John Strauss, has become the latest victim of the woke mind virus afflicting universities. This Jewish professor has been banned from campus for saying Hamas are murderers. That's all they are. Everyone should be killed. And I hope they all are killed. Students captured those remarks, posted the vision, and instead of being applauded for his moral clarity, he is now banned from campus proof. Well, we shouldn't be surprised, Rita, because, you know, the indoctrination and uh, that's going on in on campuses around the world is, you know, terrifying. And we're all aware of it and we're allowing it to happen. You know, you've got to say that university campuses are breeding grounds for woke idiots you know they're not they're not capable i believe of actually working in the real world or operating in the real world so you'd have to think twice again about sending your kids to university because you know if this kind of anti-semitism and not just anti-semitism it's all sorts of of grooming that's going on again as long as it's leftist grooming and woke grooming you know is really terrifying and it's just being taught throughout all of school life, right past, you know, into the PhD level. It's terrifying. Oh, absolutely. We've had it there from three-year-olds to uh, a, a university yeah. that is... Uh, has had a good reputation and talking about universities with good reputation let's go to harvard where activists are again showing that an ivy league education does not equal intelligence we resolutely stand in solidarity with the palestinian resistance against the apartheid state that is israel that is genocide of the palestinian people right now shamefully it is primarily black and Arab students that are facing the brunt of these racist attacks. But none of that changes our solidarity with Palestine. <laughs> we believe in a free Palestine from the river to the sea. And as we've discussed over and over again, chants like from the river to the sea are genocidal chants. And th those kids, or I shouldn't call them kids, they're young adults, would know that. Now let's go to the rhino himself, Republican in name only, Mitt Romney, who was asked who he'd be willing to vote for. Who do you like in the Republican field? Uh, anybody. Um, you know, I, I would, uh, I'd be happy to support Virtually any one of the Republicans, maybe not Vivek, but uh, but the others that are running would would be acceptable to me, and I'd be happy to vote for them. I'd be happy to vote for a number of the Democrats too. I mean, it would be an upgrade from, in my opinion, from uh, Donald Trump and and perhaps also from uh, Joe Biden. Look, I like President Biden. Um, you know, I, I find him a very charming, engaging person. So, Prue, he's willing to vote for anybody from the Republican field except the clear front-runner and Vivek. So, really, no. That's, that, that, I mean, that just shows you the cancer within the Republican Party and why so often they lose. So often they well, snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. They sure do. I mean, this is the calibre of people who 
represent, you know, politics, not just in America, across the gamut. It's people who really are so out of touch, have, in this case, he hasn't got a brain, this guy, I don't know what's happened. He's been infected with something after his years in that political sphere. But clearly, you know, they're just, they don't deserve, I mean, I hope Trump gets in and, and validates the fact that, you know, somebody who's more in touch with the average person is going to get elected than these morons who are just in another hemisphere. Well, last week we had the Argentinian Trump elected. Then we had the Dutch Trump elect, uh, well, win the most seats in the in the Netherlands general election. So uh, let's see if we Italy. can be a, a three there. Yep. Italy, we had Maloney, so yeah, yeah. and uh, Sweden, Finland. There is a bit of a wave happening in uh, many Hallelujah. parts of the West. Uh, <laughs> And finally, the 60th anniversary special of Doctor Who is coming up. And yes, it's going to be more lefties losing it content. Uh, here is Doctor Who being scolded by a transgender character. Or is it a uh, gender diverse character? I don't know. Anyway, he's scolded for calling an alien him. I promise I can help him get home and then you'll never see me again. You're assuming he as a pronoun. True. Yes, sorry, good point. Are you he or she or they? My chosen pronoun is the definite article. I am always the me. Oh, I do that. Oh, it doesn't end there. This little preview also gives a hint of uh, what fans can look forward to. Is it a shame you're not a woman anymore? Because she'd have understood. We've got all that power, but there is a way to get rid of it. Something a male presenting Time Lord will never understand. Prue, I've never seen a single episode of Doctor Who, and judging by those clips, I don't think I'm going to be starting anytime soon. I'd rather stick thumbtacks in my eyes. <laughs> well, I think this is how to destroy a franchise and disappoint so many millions of people around the world. And I'm with you. I never liked it, but there's a lot of people who did. And this is going to be the end of it, I think, the death knell. And it deserves to be, if that's the case. <laughs> Pro McSwain, thank you so much for your time today. Pleasure. Joining me now is Royal Commentator and host of the To Die For Daily podcast, Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, let's start with some breaking news on the Sussexes. Uh, tell me what Harry and Meghan's next big move is going to be. That's right. This is coming straight from TMZ today that Harry and Meghan are looking at real estate closer in within Los Angeles County, within L.A. They want to move south from Montecito, according to TMZ. Um, Rita, I don't know if you've read some of these reports that Meghan has been staying in hotels by William Morris Endeavor quite a bit lately. There have been some appearances on Twitter, people grabbing selfies with Meghan outside of hotels, but a lot of rumors circulating because Meghan was spending so much time in the city so it looks like maybe they've broken down and said let's just you know move to paparazziville uh, these are two people that stress that they need more privacy yet uh, would be headed heading to the photography capital celebrity photography capital of the world <laughs> It would be quite hilarious if uh, let's go back a couple of years and, and the whole reason for moving away from, from the royals, from London, from public service was to live private lives, to just live like ordinary people away from the media glare. And then you end up in, what, L.A.? That, that, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, uh, talking about the Sussexes, their unofficial mouthpiece, Omid Scobie's uh, upcoming book, Endgame, is going to make uh, all sorts of headlines. It's going to be launched today. The, this royal tell-all has resurfaced old allegations regarding a royal family member's comments about the potential skin colour of Harry and Meghan's son Archie. It's now alleged there was not one but two royals who made remarks about Arch Archie's skin colour. Remember that famous Oprah interview when those allegations were read and they were presented 
as something that was racist, Kinsey. It wasn't just a family member wondering what happens when a ginger and someone who's uh, mixed race has a child. What will the child look like? Who will they more resemble? This is sort of discussions every normal family has, but apparently it had racist overtones. Right. Remember Chris Rock did that like scathing, scathing set where he went after <laughs> Meghan Markle and said, everybody that is in a mixed race family has this discussion. But you're right. Omid Scobie claims that Meghan yeah. Markle wrote to a then Prince Charles accusing two people of broadcasting concerns over her son's skin tone. Uh, reports are that it might not be a member of the family, but just might be a member of the royal household, someone within the fold that made these racially insensitive comments. Neither individual is named in Scobie's book. He's, he claims he knows who they are, but he says he's not revealing them because he's fearful of litigation. I just want to remind you that Tom Bauer did reveal an individual in his book, Revenge, and the circumstances. So obviously that mm. uh, journalist wasn't fearful of litigation. And I also would like to stress that Omid has been very particular about who he sits down with, taking a, a note of the, out of the Harry and Meghan playbook, only going to Sussex sympathetic media for sit downs in regards to this book. So he doesn't have anyone challenging him. Rita, if you are going to accuse someone of racism, then you should have the gonads to sit in front of a real journalist and be challenged on wh who are you talking about? What were the circumstances? And why is it your why is it your position to to put that out there? What are you trying to accomplish? Because it is such a harsh allegation to be making, to be saying someone here is racist. Uh, there's, like you said, a massive difference between someone who's racist, who perhaps doesn't want this child to have a dark complexion than someone who's just a family member or within the circle who is wondering out loud, I wonder what uh, this uh, firstborn is going to look like. Who is he going to more closely resemble given the parents are so different, uh, which is in no way racist. It, it all, it's all about the intention, the motivation, where it's coming from. And that certainly wasn't really explained during that Oprah interview either. Now, this uh, book, is also going to allege that amid the Queen's declining health, Prince Harry's attempts to reach out to Prince William were met with silence. Supposedly, Harry was totally ignored by his older brother as he tried to see his dying grandmother. Uh, Harry's unanswered attempts prompted him to book a $30,000 private plane to Scotland, Kinsey. No one's going to be too surprised that Omid's book is told from the Sussexes' perspective, but the venom here is is something to behold. What really happened during the Queen's final days? That's going to be of enormous interest to to millions of Brits and royal watchers around the world. Uh, what more can you tell us about Harry and Meghan's version of events, which is what we're presuming Omid Scobie is writing in his book? Right. Hashtag tacky, because you're right. Like the, the what <laughs> happened within those last few days and hours is, you know, most would consider sacred. The, those are the stories you want to keep within the family. Um, you know, what I actually think is happening here, Rita, is Omid has been open about the fact that he believes Prince William has cut off his access to members of the royal family that are still working within the royal family. What we're seeing is someone that has nothing to lose. So Omid is going full steam at Prince William. Why? Because Prince William cutting off Omid's access has limited Omid's um, you know, professional opportunities. Omid has gone through multiple mm -hmm. jobs since Harry and Meghan left for America, and he is going after Prince William in this book. That is his main target. He says that Prince William was ignoring Harry's calls leading up to the hours of the Queen's death. I'm sorry, that's called consequences for being a jerk and bad-mouthing his wife on television. But a, a few paragraphs before that, Oh, Omid says that Harry doesn't answer calls from unknown numbers. So how do we know that William didn't call his brother mm. from an unknown number to arrange travel with him? But what I think we're seeing here is a very unhappy Omid Scobie realizing that his prof professional opportunities are limited. So he's throwing everything he can at this book. 
because he doesn't know what the future holds for him because he chose the opposition. Well, yes, and we saw the damage Harry's own book did to, to his relationship with the royals, and you wonder whether this book, though he hasn't penned it, uh, is going to cause further irreparable damage between Harry and, and the rest of his family because, uh, wrongly or rightly, they're going to look at this uh, attack against Prince William as coming from Harry or coming from Harry's camp. You're absolutely right. And while Omid says that he is not communicating with Meghan directly, he does admit that, Harry, that, that he has friends in common with Meghan. And so, you know, how is that any different than claiming William works with the media through a third party if you are working with someone in Meghan's camp? It's, it's, it's hypocrisy. It's the exact same thing. Now, finally, Kinsey, Gigi Hadid is being accused of anti-Semitism and of uh, promoting dangerous falsehoods about Israel. She has reposted a video to her millions of followers on Instagram alleging Israel harvests the organs of Palestinian. The supermodel posted this video, um, which makes all sorts of allegations, including the organ harvesting. Uh, She's the face of major brands. Are there going to, going to be, I don't know, consequences? Will there be any fallout for her? Unfortunately, Rita, I think that if your job is to get you know, paid a lot of money to be half naked, you get away with a lot of stuff. I mean, no one's claiming, no one has ever claimed <laughs> that this woman is necessarily bright. But in this particular instance, it's it's kind of appalling to to put out such false hit hoods to nearly, to nearly 80 million people. Remember, she also said within this specific post that Israel was the only country that held minors um, and, and, and it was a war crime when the individual she was talking about had like stabbed three people, attempted to murder them. You know, maybe mm. that maybe that person did belong in jail. Uh, so I think that this is another Nepo baby that needs to know her place and understand when it's when it's not the right time to chime in. And if you are going to chime in, do your research, investigate, and know that what you're putting out into your nearly 80 million followers is the truth and is not a crazy wow. conspiracy theory. I mean, it's, 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 this, it could do so much harm, Rita. Oh, I'm sure it will, because uh, sadly we do have a whole generation that gets its news from uh, Instagram or TikTok, and they do listen to people like Gigi Hadid. And I wonder if she was the reason why Kylie Jenner deleted that post standing with Israel. Remember right uh, after October 7, she posted uh, an, a story and then deleted it. And you wonder why would you delete something as positive as... I stand with Israel, but then she is friends with uh, with the Hadids, and I'm sure uh, they would have been amongst those who would have been uh, critical of her. Kinsey Schofield, always a pleasure. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Joining me now is broadcaster and commentator Emily Carver. A reported 50,000 demonstrators rallied in London against anti-Semitism on Sunday, decrying the surge in hate crimes against Jews following Hamas's brutal attack on Israel and Israel's counter-offensive in Gaza. This was uh, organised by Campaign Against Anti-Semitism and the protesters were brandishing signs like shoulder to shoulder with British Jews, zero tolerance for anti-Semites, uh, while others displayed images of Israeli hostages held by Hamas. Emily, it's a shame that a march like this needs to happen, but it's certainly necessary. And it's worth noting that no monuments were defaced in this protest, no British flags were torn down, and there were no uh, pro-genocide chants. Yes, it has been. A, it was a stark contrast uh, from what we saw on the day before, which was Saturday. So we've had over four or five weeks. We've had every single Saturday in central London, hundreds of thousands of people coming out in pro-Palestine protests, uh, anti-Israel protests. 
And we have seen, unfortunately, people clambering over our war memorials. We've seen jihadi groups, mm. or at least those who sympathize with jihadi groups. We've seen Islamist flags in central London, which really has been a disgrace and quite upsetting for people to see. And a lot of British Jews have told me that they have felt fearful of coming into central London on those Saturdays and also fearful where they live elsewhere in the country. So this is a bit of uplifting news, actually, from Great Britain, which is nice to talk about. Mm. It was actually about 100,000 plus people who came out yesterday oh, on wow. Sunday. I, I was there and it was extraordinary. It was uplifting. It was uh, somber at times, but then there was a lot of cheer as well. There were nice signs. There were actually some nice placards, things like uh, things like hummus, not hate, spread hummus, not hate, uh, Jews belong here, um, never again is now. And it was a lovely collection of people there who all wanted to stand together against anti-Semitism because I don't know about you in Australia, but here in the UK, we've seen a shocking rise in anti-Semitic incidents. Oh, absolutely. Similar scenes here. But we also learned that uh, former English Defence League uh, leader Tommy Robinson was arrested and pepper sprayed by the Metropolitan Police during that protest. Uh, he was arrested by dozens of officers outside a, a cafe uh, over his fears that they expressed for... Um, he, his mere presence was going to cause alarm and distress. Let's just have a quick look at this. Who am I causing alarm and distress to? Who am I causing alarm and distress to? This man is a Zionist and a support of Israel and he's been arrested. Who am I causing alarm and distress to? No, you tell me. Just listen to me. Tell me. Tell me. Time by my watch now is... Sorry, officer, but I have a job and I believe in freedom of the press. Robinson, whose real name is Stephen Yaxley Lennon, uh, also posted a video on social media showing the effect of pepper spray, synthetic pepper spray that the officers had used. My eyes, man. For what? For what? Tear spasm straight in the eyes. For what? That's your two tier policing system. Emily, this has uh, gained a great deal of attention uh, on social media. Do the police have different standards for different people? Is this two-tier policing? Well, this is one of the questions that the police have been facing over the course of these protests, particularly in light of the pro-Palestine protests. They've been accused of taking a far too soft approach when it comes to people chanting for jihad on the streets of London, but when it comes to Tommy Robinson, they are very quick to arrest him because he refused to leave the protest. Now, Tommy Robinson is a hugely controversial figure in this country and across the world. He was the uh, former leader of the English Defence League, which I believe is now debunked. But he, he made it very clear on his social media, he's back on Twitter, he made it very clear on his social media that he was going to be at the march. And some of the uh, organizers of the event were very much aware of this and they weren't particularly happy with him coming along because where Tommy Robinson goes disruption often comes to and there can be violence not necessarily from him himself or perpetrated by himself but from people who might go along to show support to him or might cause trouble um, usually you know the football hooligan type might come along but it is interesting that the police have been so soft touch previously when it comes to pro-Palestine march and some of the extreme elements at those marches. But when it comes to Tommy Robinson, they were very quick to get him out of that protest. And this feeds into the narrative that the police decide when they wish to act and they decide when they don't. And often it may be based on politics or what's easier for them to do. Well, I just think it's utterly bizarre if someone hasn't broken the law, if they're not... Mm. Uh, 
being aggressive or threatening people or doing anything to warrant police attention, how you could have that many officers manhandling them, pepper spraying them, arresting them for because people in the crowd may not like their presence. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought that's how a liberal democracy is supposed to operate. Now, let's talk about Ireland because uh, well, also, Risa, the scenes also, there Risa, are sorry troubling. To, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt there, but also there have been a lot of people out in central London who a lot of other people wouldn't like around and the police have not made a fuss when it comes to them. So I think they really need to be mindful of how they're being perceived by some members of the public. And then there is this two tier policing. And I think it is actually very true. There's a huge amount of evidence to back it up. Oh, absolutely. And that's what Suella Braverman wrote about uh, uh, and uh, she was 100% correct, uh, though the Tories did not want to hear it. Now, talking about Ireland and the scenes there, there were riots following the stabbing of five people in Dublin, uh, three children among them. Uh, this was uh, allegedly by an immigrant who years ago was supposed to be deported, but was then granted citizenship. I'm not exactly sure what has happened there. Police said the man, man in his 50s was arrested with no other suspects involved. Now, politicians and law enforcement were quick to blame the riots on hooligans and what they called far-right agitators. But, Emily, the anger here is... Uh, is against the authorities who, who many Irish people say have let them down and they, they, they can, that cannot be denied, the fact that there is genuine anger in the community and sure, no one endorses rioting or looting or any sort of criminal behaviour but, but the anger there uh, is grounded in some real issues. Well, yes. I mean, on the the day after, the morning after the riots that broke out, the morning after that horrific knife attack on those three children outside a primary school in Dublin, I spoke to our GB News Irish reporter who was there in Dublin at the scene of the crime and then at the scene of the riots. And he told me that it's been a tinderbox for a long time now. Ireland is quite a small population and they've had huge inflows of migration and also illegal migrants and refugees. And the government is ignoring and has ignored many of the concerns of ordinary people. As I said, no one condones, well, very few people would condone the type of violence we saw and the looting and the setting double-decker buses alight. But that doesn't take away from the fact that a lot of Irish people have oh, deep no. concerns with the speed of immigration into their country. Country. And of course, this was the catalyst for this was a horrific knife attack from a, an Algerian descent man uh, in Ireland and people, it became, you know, it, it, it appears to be a tinderbox in Ireland. And I do worry that we may see more of these kind of outbursts unless governments realise that people aren't happy with what has happened so far. Now, and from some of the videos I've seen, there did seem to be an element of troublemakers, opportunists who uh, came to these protests just to loot. And uh, I don't think they were at all concerned about the issues from the images I've seen. But uh, I think we're going to see a lot more here. And in the meantime, we've got the Irish police uh, investigating, reportedly, UFC fighter Conor McGregor's social media posts following concerns about rising hate speech online after these riots. McGregor distanced himself from those riots but has urged for change in Ireland and he slammed the government's immigration policies. Uh, the former UFC champion warned in a post on X if the government do not act soon with their plan of action to ensure Ireland's safety, I will. I mean, is this an announcement, Emily, that he's going to enter politics? Well, it does look like it. This is a man, he's a mixed martial arts fighter. He's got an absolutely enormous following in Ireland and, of course, around the world too. And he's been very vocal since this all erupted about Ireland's migration policy. He clearly believes that the Irish government has got it completely wrong. He clearly has absolutely no respect for the Prime Minister in Ireland, Leo Varadkar. So maybe he is setting out his stall to get involved in politics. But what's interesting is now the Irish police are now investigating his tweets. 
And Leo Varadkar has made it very clear that he wants to tighten up hate speech leg legislation as a result of what's been talked about since this horrific knife attack and the subsequent riots that we saw. And this is what always happens with our Western leaders. They see people get angry on social media, often about issues to do with migration. And what is their first response? We must clamp down on speech. That is not how a government should be dealing with these issues, which people feel very angry and feel very motivated about. So I think this is completely the wrong approach from the Irish government. I think Conor mm. McGregor, we may well be seeing more of him, but I imagine Leo Varadkar and the Irish government are going to try and do as much as they can to put a lid on him and stop him from tweeting so much to his massive audience. Now, talking about uh, Leo Varadkar, he is uh, pledging to expedite those laws you spoke about, about online hatred, uh, online speech. Uh, he's told a press conference that I think it's now very obvious to anyone who might have doubted it that our incitement to hatred legislation is just not up to date. Uh, and this is a sinister little explanation from Irish Senator Pauline O'Reilly about how these laws will restrict freedom for the common good. Let's have a listen. You will see throughout our constitution, yes, you have rights, but they are restricted for the common good. Everything needs to be balanced. And if your views on other people's identities go to make their lives unsafe, insecure, and cause them such deep discomfort that they cannot live in peace, then I believe that it is our job as legislators to restrict those freedoms for the common good. Emily, that's uh, disturbing. It's Orwellian uh, enforcing laws that make it illegal to say things that some may feel is offensive, that could cause discomfort. Uh, that was her explanation. Uh, is that really the way to go? And, and will these laws be supported? That's the important thing. Will the Irish people back this proposed legislation? You know, I thought we had individual rights. I thought we'd agreed on that in liberal democracy, that the rights of the individual must be upheld. Clearly, they're not. It reminds me of the pandemic, this idea of common good. So, you know, vaccine passports, very highly restrictive lockdown in order for the common good. And then you forget completely about individual rights and their right to expression, their right to freedom of speech. These are fundamental for a functioning liberal democracy. And this woman, she may feel genuinely that she's doing this for the common good, yeah. but what right does she have to talk about how we need to clamp down on people's basic individual rights in a liberal democracy to express themselves freely if they are not inciting violence. That should be the threshold. And I worry that Ireland's threshold is going to get lower and lower and lower and people will have their speech fundamentally restricted. Emily Carver, thank you so much for your time today. Now, last Thursday, hundreds of Victorian students skipped classes to join a bunch of activists in an anti-Israeli demonstration in the Melbourne CBD. Students taking part in the school strike gathered on the steps of Flinders Street Station at 1.30pm where they were chanting things like, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, a genocidal chant that would mean the eradication of the only Jewish state. Victoria Police seemed entirely comfortable with uh, those sort of anti-Semitic slurs and intimidation. What sparked them into action, however, was a peaceful pro-Israel protester. Adam Kahlberg and three of his friends were at the protest to counter the anti-Israeli sentiment, but after being accosted by pro-Palestinian protesters at various points, he was then targeted by police. He accused him of breaching the peace. Here's some footage from Channel 10 News uh, showing Adam being approached by police officers. One man carrying an Israel flag was told to move on. Police concerned his presence would spark clashes between the groups. Well, they were chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I don't think they really understand what that means. They're chanting about genocide. Adam, walk us through what happened, why the police approached you, were you being uh, aggressive, were you doing anything unlawful? Yeah, so as you can see, um, 
on Thursday, obviously they had their students for Palestine um, rally and I decided to go down to show kind of an opposing voice and an opposing view, um, a, a pro-Israel side. And three of my friends who happened to be in the city at the time um, joined me. So I went down um, across the road from Flinders Street, just on the opposite corner. I had with me a flag that I had in my bag at the time, um, some like kidnapped posters and some kidnapped stickers. Um, kidnapped Israelis, that is. I decided to pull out the flag and it, was, it wasn't stretched out at all. It was pretty scrunched up. And then within about a minute, a police officer had come up to me and basically told me that he advised me to put the flag away because if something was to happen, um, I could be uh, in trouble for breaching the peace, even if someone had you know, come up to me and caused a ruckus. And I tried to be very clear that oh. I was a bit surprised that it would be my fault if something like that had happened. Um, that police officer basically said, look, I advise you to put it away, but you know, do what you want. And then he went away. About two or three minutes later, um, three more police officers came up to us. And at this point, they weren't really up for discussion. Um, one of the, the male officer basically just took the flags, took the posters, took the stickers. Um, and what? the female officer was trying to have a bit more of a discussion with me. Um, but between the two in, um, incidents, nothing had really occurred. Um, a male had tape pulled down one of the stickers and I had just asked him why, but that was the only thing. But nothing violent. No one had really come up to me and said anything. Um, and then, yeah, two of my friends got moved on because they were in tr uh, because they were just asking questions. And but I was allowed to stay. So it kind of got a little bit worse from there. I, I followed the crowd down and was hearing chants of mm. um, the classic chants of "Free, Free Palestine" and um, "From the River to the Sea." And I decided I would, you know, after about five or ten minutes, I added in. Um, from Hamas, to, it was an extension of the chant, which um, upset a lot of mm. the protesters. Um, I was subsequently told to f off by a couple of teenage girls, and it kind of got to the point where the protesters stopped on a corner. One of the girls who told me to f off came up to me and basically said, "If someone doesn't punch you, I'm going to hook you." Um, at this point, there were a couple of other, say, 15 or 16 year old boys who kind of gathered around. And then a police officer came mm. after the girl had said that she'd come face to face with me, pulled my arm, basically took me to the pavement um, and said, you were warned to, uh, you were told to move on, which I wasn't. And he also um, indicated that I'd been aggressive um, and been resisting him, which also wasn't true at all. So let me get this straight. You're there. The, the, you've got an Israeli flag, which uh, seems to trigger police across the country. As soon as they see the blue and white, they spark into action. Uh, you're told you could be in trouble if, if trouble starts, even if you haven't caused it. And then yeah. you have people threatening you, threatening to hook you, punch you, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and the cops target you instead of those making the threats. I mean, this seems like textbook victim blaming to me. That's astonishing. Are you going to pursue this with the police and try to get an explanation of their behaviour on that day or have you made a police uh, a complaint at all? Yeah, so, look, I first want to say that I completely understand that it's a really difficult situation for the police and, you know, they're, I think, a bit scarred from what happened at COVID and what happened a couple of weeks ago in Caulfield with things escalating. And from a logistical perspective, I understand, you know, potentially the need to move me on at some point. However, we can't, I, I find it a bit difficult to understand how we can allow people to be saying potentially genocidal chants running down the street, which I find very offensive. But then if I was to pull out a flag, I get moved on in case, you know, or I'd be in trouble for breaching the peace if someone was to hit me. So I have, I spoke to my yeah. member for um, parliament and he said he would take it up with the assistant commissioner. Um, and the, I will say most of my interactions with the police, 99% of them have been great. It was just, unfortunately on that, um, on that day, it seemed to be, I think that a heightened level of um, stress and, I don't think they really necessarily read the well, situation. Well, you're being very understanding, Adam. Yeah. You're yeah. being very understanding, more understanding than I would be because I think your experience here mirrors what we've seen uh, elsewhere, particularly in Sydney, where we've had men with Israeli flags uh, arrested or apprehended now, at least on a couple of times on camera. It happened again on Friday. Let's have a look. Do you believe this is a case of two-tier policing where 
The police think it's easier to target the law-abiding lone protester uh, who's pro-Israel than the, the, the mob who can be quite angry and agitated if challenged. Uh, so they, 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 they go for the easy option rather than actually enforcing the law. Yeah, I, I, I do think that is the case. Um, and I definitely think that there is this idea that maybe the mob or for whatever reason is potentially more violent or they may spark something. And I don't think that's right because for every right opportunity that they have to protest, and especially when it comes to young children in high school who should be learning about, you know, critical thinking skills and how to assess a situation, we're not allowed to have an opposing voice or a voice that's a different opinion because it may cause something, but they're allowed to spout things that are wildly offensive um, inaccurate as well. And simply being there with an Israeli flag is enough to, you know, be quite um, provocative. And I don't think that that's fair. Um, I think that, sh you know, sometimes you look at the states where they do protect, you know, other types of speech that may be seen, may be deemed quite um, offensive or provocative. And there is a little bit more protection. I think in this case, that might need to be um, implemented or might be more, might be necessary. Adam, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Rita. Have a good one. Thank <laughs> you.